We open on a scene of the Demon Lord's defeat and at last, the world can have its peace once more. The hero in spandex and a lucha mask looks over the cliff triumphantly, knowing he has finally completed his goal, but now there is one more thing he needs to do. He looks over at the princess, and as their eyes lock, he goes begone thought and drop kicks her across the face. This turns out to be a game and our MC has been wanting to do that ever since he got the first fine 1000 fragments across the map mission from her. She had it coming. In this world, VR technology has greatly improved, immersing people in games like never before. But with new graphic technology, there also comes the games that instead of actual gameplay or features, have fancy rain rendering. The games that have come to be known collectively as trash. But there are still those that are drawn to these dumpster fires of games and seek them out only to laugh at how garbage they are. Rakuro Hizutame is one such person with that kind of game addiction. Aside from that though, he is still your average second year high schooler and has to head into school after spending the entire night gaming. While he walks through the halls, we see this girl building up the courage to talk to him and she is finally ready to ask him to hang out. However, she gets her chance interrupted after Rekuro's friends come up to him and ask him about the game he was playing that night. After school, we see this woman Mana Iwamaki putting up a poster to bring in customers when the girl with a crush on Rakuro walks in and greets her. Mana can tell that she is looking for Rakuro, since he usually stops by here to pick up his latest trash game, but he isn't here right now. Last time she saw him, he had just picked up the Fairy of Chronicles and was planning to put everything he has got into beating it. The game is called Trash because Faria, who is supposed to be your AI assistant, is of no use at all, and the game has the difficulty of Dark Souls on steroids with bugs on par with Cyberpunk's first release. Just then, Rakuro walks in, and as soon as Rei sees him, she disappears into the back. Mana grates him and asks how Faria Chronicles went, and it was absolute trash, just like he expected. But the worst part by far was Faria herself. She would cause literally all the problems in the game, including murdering random villagers by accident. Then she would blame the whole thing on the demon lord even though it was all because of her. And worse yet, she is highly allergic to accountability. So if you even try to insinuate that she is at fault, she will get mad at you and stop you from progressing the game. Even Aqua was more useful than this. That would be enough to make almost anyone quit the game, but there was one thing that kept him going through it all. Once you actually defeat the demon lord, there is a brief 3 minute window where you are allowed to do whatever you want, and as we've already seen, Rakuro knew exactly what he wanted to do to Faria. Now that he's done with that mess, he has to see what he wants to play next, so Mana suggests he plays a game that is actually good this time. Shangri-La Frontier, but he's played so many trash games that he doesn't know what to expect from a good one. He logs in for the first time and sees a menu asking him to create his character, and he is amazed by such a simple feature, because he became so used to games that had no customization options. He takes a grip on himself and finally gets into creating his character. And this is what he ends up with. Rikuro's playstyle involves ignoring all armor in favor of the strongest weapon possible. After all, who needs armor, just don't get hit. However, as this is virtual reality and his face is still going to be displayed, he opts to wear this bird mask to hide his identity and preserve some of his dignity. He also selects his class as a wanderer because it comes with a sweet luck boost and loads up the game and finds himself in a wooded forest. He is amazed that he can actually move like he normally would in real life, and that the controls of the game are so realistic, as well as the surrounding area's design. He opens his map to find out where he is and locates the starting village quite a distance away. Normally, new players would spawn in the starting village, but since he selected the Wanderer class, he starts out in a random spot on the beginner map. He starts walking over to the village while also checking out his stats where he finds that his vitality is only at 3 due to his choice to not wear armor or clothes. As he walks, he notices something behind him and gets attacked by a goblin charging from a tree. He's able to dodge it in time and pulls out his blades to fight it, and as it swings at him, he sidesteps and one-shots it. The goblin drops its axe and gives Rakuro enough experience to level him up to level 2. He doesn't have much time to rest though as a killer bunny attacks him soon after. He dodges the bunny's attack and causes it to go flying into a tree, destroying it in the process. He can tell that one hit from that knife would be the end of him, so as the bunny attacks again, he blocks and counterattacks. However, the bunny is a bit tougher than the goblin and won't go down to one critical hit, so as it comes in for another strike, he parries it and stabs it again, finally killing it. The bunny gave him enough points to go from level 2 to level 4 instantly, and he also acquired a skill which gives him a bonus every time he blocks an attack. He also realizes that this entire time he has been playing, he hasn't come across any bugs in the code at all, so he can have as much fun as he wants, so he is going to keep hunting for those killer bunnies until they drop their knives since he thinks they are cool. 
Sometime later and after some major grinding, Rakuro has reached level 12 and has gotten two of those killer bunny knives. Those bunnies are pretty rare on their own, but he had to kill 50 of them to get these two knives. Considering he has gotten everything that he wanted from this area, he wants to move on to the second village, Secondale. But to do that, he must cross this bridge guarded by the area boss Snake. The game recommends a party of three take on the challenge, but with Rakuro's skill, he can handle this one alone. When Rei first heard that Rakuro would be playing Shangri-La Frontier, she decided to go to the starter village since all new players would usually head there first. She has apparently been playing the game for a while and is at a really high level, so the players in the first village are pretty scared of her. She searches through the people there looking for Rakuro's name since he always uses the same name for every game he plays, but when she doesn't see Rakuro's name there, she logs out thinking she must have just missed him in the crowd. Meanwhile, Rakuro is squaring up to fight the area boss to move on to the second village. He activates a skill that gives him a boost to his evasion so he can learn the attack patterns of the snake. The snake is meant to be a beginner boss, so its attack patterns are really simple to learn and it can easily be dodged. But when it comes to attacking, Rekuro's regular knives are not going to cut it because their durability is too low. So he decides this is as good a time as any to try out the killer bunny knives he got in the forest. As the snake strikes again, he leaps up into the air and prepares to attack once more. But he, in his overconfidence, he missed one part of the snake's attack pattern and gets sprayed with poison from the snake's tail. The poison causes one HP loss every 10 seconds, so he is now on a timer to defeat it before he dies to it. He needs to find a more reliable means to land critical hits on this thing, since it is still covered in scales and has great defense, so he comes up with the idea of creating a wound in the scales and then attacking the same spot repeatedly to get critical hits, but he doesn't know how much health this thing has or how much damage he is doing to it, so he is just shooting blind here. The snake smacks him upwards and heals its wound, making Rakuro realize that he had gotten cocky because of how good he was at all the terrible games that he has been playing. He had thought this game is just for casual gamers, so it should be easy. But as he falls into the snake's mouth, he refuses to give up and keeps himself from being eaten and counters with a stab to the eye which proves to be enough to defeat it. He has leveled up to level 14 from the victory, but realizes that he is still poisoned and doesn't have much time before he dies. He dumps all his newly acquired stat points into agility and stamina so that he can run to the next village and buy an antidote, but he doesn't know where the shop would be located, so he's just going to have to wing it. In the second village, there is a guy called Reiji who finally convinced his crush to start playing the game with him, and he is playing the role of the advice-giving veteran. They are going out to find her a pet in-game, but before they can go, they see Rakuro running straight towards them and Mai is freaked out by him. She thinks he is a bird monster on account of his mask, but Reiji recognizes that Rakuro is a player and must have gotten poisoned by the snake and is about to die. He advised him to go straight to the inn and get in a bed to set his respawn point there, which Rakuro is really thankful for. Maayi also found it really cool how Reiji knew exactly what to say to help that guy, so Reiji is also grateful to Rakuro for being his accidental wingman. Rakuro makes his way into the inn and gets a room after skipping all the dialogue from the clerk, he jumps into bed and saves his respawn point just before he dies to the poison. Later, Rakuro respawns in the second village and is walking through town looking for places to buy his essentials, but the people around him think he is a little weird for not putting on any kind of armor, so he goes to an armory to buy some light armor. After that, he heads to the weapon shop and tries selling the goblin axe, but it isn't worth anything, so he asks to see the weapons that the blacksmith has on sale. Nothing there is really any better than the knives he got from the bunnies, and the blacksmith explains that that is to be expected, since those knives are pretty rare or come across. If he wants anything better, then he would have to order one. Rakuro didn't know he could have the blacksmith make weapons for him, so the blacksmith confirms, adding that he would need to bring in the materials for it though. Rakuro heads out to find some of the materials required from the dire marsh wastes where ores can be mined. But he isn't getting lucky with his drops at all. The ore drops here are what he needs to get a weapon made, but in 30 minutes of mining, he was only able to get two gray ore while he needs five or six of them. Just then, a mud frog appears behind him, but isn't a hostile creature, so it won't be a problem to just leave it alone, but then the frog sprays mud on him and it just became personal. He tosses his pickaxe at the frog and knocks it over before making his way over to finish it off. Very, very slowly, he finally gets to the frog and kills it to let off some steam, and after that, it's back to mining for him. Over time, more and more players are going to need to get the ores from this place, and once that happens, there's going to be a lot of competition, so the best time to collect the ores is right now. After a lot of mining, he has finally gotten all the ores he needs and even finds one really special one which can be used for a rare set of daggers. The blacksmith tells him that he can come back with more ores later to raise the weapon's level to make it stronger. 
Rakuro appreciates the information and is impressed with how natural the NPC's dialogue is, but while he is still thinking to himself, the blacksmith tells him he should probably hurry home since it's getting dark, and to make sure not to leave the village at night because nocturnal monsters are incredibly powerful and aggressive. Rakuro listens to his advice and then does the exact opposite as he goes out at night to hunt some monsters. Meanwhile, Rei has checked the entirety of the beginner village for Rakuro and hasn't found him, so she concludes that he must have made his way to the second village after defeating the boss, all without ever going to the first village, which is basically impossible for any normal player. But for him, it is pretty reasonable. Rakuro is currently engaged in battle with a red cap goblin that is unreasonably strong for a goblin. He is struggling to beat it because of its speed and smart fighting tactics, and to make it all worse, it then calls him back up to jump Rakuro and he doesn't know if he can make it out alive of this one. However, that's exactly the kind of high-stakes adrenaline rush that he loves and he is all in for the battle. But then he encounters something he could never have prepared for, a unique monster wolf. Elsewhere in the game, Rei has come across Reiji and Mai who saw Rakuro, when he first arrived at the second village. She has finally gotten a lead on where he might be, so she asks them where he went and what he looked like. Reiji explains that he came running into the second village after he got poisoned by the snake and was wearing no clothes and a bird mask on his head. With that information, she plans to continue her search, but before leaving, she gives them a teleporter as a token of her appreciation and speeds off. Mayi asks who the scary-looking night girl was, but he isn't sure. What he does know, however, is that the emblem on her back belongs to a guild that is focused on the unique monster, Lekagon, the Night Slayer. Unique monsters are special classes of monsters that exist within the game. Normal monsters respawn after a set amount of time, but there is only one unique monster each type in the world. They are called Colossi, and there are supposedly seven of them across the entire game world, and many of the top guilds have made their goal hunting down these unique monsters, but no one actually knows the conditions for getting one to spawn. So basically, they are extremely rare monsters, and are also ridiculously strong as well. This game has been running for over a year now, but even with a player base of over 30 million, not one player has actually managed to defeat one of them. That is the same unique monster that Rakuro is currently facing. He was already struggling with the goblins, but that thing blew them away in seconds, and now he has to face him. The wolf lunges at Rakuro, but he manages to pull off a perfect parry which allows the user to block all damage from a strike with the right timing. He gets flung backwards and laughs in the face of the monster, but internally, he is quaking in his boots because if he hadn't learnt perfect parry, he would have definitely been dead by now. The wolf attacks again and Rakuro realizes that he'll be dead if he is even a second late in his movements. He decides to go all in and activates all the useful skills he has got to deliver a critical hit to the monster's paw. It slashes him again, but he is able to dodge and deliver another critical hit. But then the moon fades behind the clouds and the wolf disappears. Rakuro is left confused as to where the wolf went, but then it appears behind him and tries to strike him again. The fight continues, and as the moon is covered again, the wolf disappears and sneak attacks Rakuro, but he is able to avoid the fatal blow once more. He has been fighting this wolf for over 5 minutes now and hasn't taken a single bit of damage the entire time, but the wolf's hide is so thick that he's not sure he is doing any damage even though he has landed over 200 critical hits. His weapon is also running out of durability, so if he doesn't find a weak spot on this thing soon, there's no way he can win. This fight is way out of his league as a beginner, but that is exactly how he likes his challenges, impossibly difficult and borderline psychotic. But this time, the challenge proves to be too much for Rakuro to handle and he finds himself on the ground, missing both legs and about to be killed. At this moment, he decided that he doesn't care about the game's main story or completing any other side quests, he is going to defeat Likagan at some day. That day may not be today, but he is definitely going to do it. And as Likagan delivers the final blow and kills him, he is given a new status effect, Likagan's Curse. He responds in the second village and finds his body now has red marks all over it. This is part of Lekagon's curse and no items can be equipped to the afflicted area, so he's thoroughly screwed since he now can't wear armor, even if he wanted to. And on top of that, the only way to get rid of the curse is to get a saint to do it, or to kill the one who placed the curse in the first place. He's now back to being viewed as a weirdo by all the other players, but he's got to stay calm and take the best course of action with the cards he has been dealt. With how many games he has played with bugs that put you in a serious disadvantage, he should be able to get through this. He first decides to allocate the stat points that he got from fighting Lickagon, but he can only really put them into stamina or agility, now since with no armor, upgrading HP would be pointless. He continues to agonize over his situation when a bunny suddenly drops out of the sky and lands on his head. It is a little too classy to be a killer bunny, so he thinks it must be some kind of game event. 
He chases it through the alleyway until it walks into a glowing door in the middle of a wall. The door reads, Unique Scenario, Invitation of Rabatuza. He had read about something like this being in the game before. With an expansion main story, Shangri-La also has several side missions, including unique scenarios which are said to give top-class skills and equipment, so there's no way he is going to pass it up now that he has encountered one. He enters the door, but what he failed to see is that the recommended level for taking on the scenario is 80, but his level is only 28. Rakuro walks into the Rabatuza and is greeted by the bunny, which he had followed in here. It praises him for his fight against Lickigan despite his low level and was greatly impressed by how well he dodged the attacks before finally being defeated. But though Rakuro didn't manage to do much damage to it, that was only because of Lekagan's overwhelming power. And even Lekagan acknowledged him as an opponent, which is why he placed a curse on him. The bunnies have been wanting to meet Rakuro ever since then, and that is why Emol was sent to go and fetch him by their boss. Rakuro asks if there is any chance that their boss is angry about the bunnies Rakuro killed, while trying to get the matching knives, but that has nothing to do with any of this. She takes him up to the palace where the boss is waiting for him, and since he is the first person to ever be brought here, he is quite excited to see what kind of reward he will be getting. But as he is brought into the room, what he sees is the most mafia looking bunny he's ever seen, Visage, and it makes him tense up a bit as Visage asks him to chat for a little bit. It's the middle of summer break and back at the video game store, Raid is still stalking the entrance in case Rakuro decides to stop by here as she can't find him in the game. Mana walks up to her and informs her that since it is summer break, he likely won't be coming back for a while and will be engrossed in playing Shangri-La. It's kind of odd she hasn't been able to find him at all in the game, but that's because he skipped the tutorial altogether and went straight to the second village. Mana finds it funny to hear what he did, but that sounds about right for something Rakuro would do. She wishes Ray luck in her quest to find Rakuro in the game, or alternatively, she could just ask him to play with her the next time she sees him IRL. But for her, directly talking to her crush is out of the question. At Rakuro's house, his little sister, Rumi, is heading out and telling him that she will be coming back late since she has work later. Meanwhile, Rakuro is busy reading up on everything there is to know about unique scenarios. The invitation to Rabatuza is a unique scenario triggered after defeating a monster of a higher level than yourself with the weapon acquired from a bunny. The wiki page says that once the event is triggered, a bunny will appear in the city around a player and run around before leading them to Rabatuza. Once in the rabbit city, the player will be tasked with defeating a giant snake that is plaguing them and upon doing so will learn the spell Enchant Vorpal. He encountered a Yakuza bunny that felt just as intimidating as Lekagan. This act told Rakura that he was very impressed by the fight he had with Lick again, and even more so with the Vorpal Spirit that he showed, but Rakura has no idea what Vorpal Spirit is meant to be. Vizash then continues that he would be happy to train Rakuro up to a point where he can handle Lick again, at which point he realizes that this must be a training quest, which could yield great buffs for him. So he has no reason to refuse and gets down on his knees saying, I place myself in your hands, brother. The last brother part caught Vizach's attention and gets him to stand up in all his terrifying presence. He starts walking over to Rakuro, making him think he might have been a little too familiar with him and said something wrong. But quite the contrary, Visaki likes that kind of response and tells Rakuro that he can call him Vash. He says he sees potential in Rakuro and puts him in the care of Imul, his daughter for now. She is really excited and wants to get right into showing him around the palace, but Rakuro tells her that he has been playing for a really long time now and wants to take a break for a little bit and also take some time to look up the whole unique scenario and unique monsters thing. Emil is disappointed, but she tells Rakuro that she can show him to the inn they have in the palace, so he can set his respawn point there and he is all for it. However, before Vash leaves, he remembers there was something he had to do and throws a collar into the air and around Rakuro's neck. The Vorpal Soul Collar has the effect of cutting the experience one gains in half, but it also raises the stat number of stat points acquired by 2.5 times. He tries to take the collar off after realizing that the collar restricts his experience gain, but he is told that he is unable to take off the collar unless Vash allows it, and it is necessary to place restrictions to bring out the most growth. Rakuro isn't too happy about the new restriction on his experience points, but after thinking about it a little, the stat point increase is ridiculously advantageous, so it's not that bad. After checking all the online forums, he hasn't found anyone that knows about Vash or Emil, much less the Vorpal Soul Collar or the Rabatuza Palace. Meaning this is a unique scenario which he alone knows about, and that makes him happy. He looks at the time and realizes that he has an appointment in another game with a friend of his called Katzo. He has to go meet him in Berserk Online, which he hasn't played in a long time. 
The game is obviously a trash game, and over the years, its player base has reduced to only 100 logins a day, leading many to wonder why they are still keeping the service going. With such a small player base, everyone who is still playing the game knows each other as they are all fellow trash game enthusiasts. Now that Rakuro has logged in and met Katso, they get down to business and begin their fight. There is only one rule in place, there are no rules, so Katso starts off with a tentacle arm glitched attack that he discovered while Rakuro was playing Feria Chronicles. Though this neither impresses nor phases him as he uses his own glitched attack and instant punch glitch. With this attack, he can block any attack as long as his EP stays above 12. Even an insta-kill wouldn't be able to get through his barrage of fists. As they continue to fight, the other players recognize Katso and Rakuro and all go over to watch since this is a matchup with the top-tier players of the bug-out game. Rakuro finally manages to break through Katso's defense and cuts one of his hands off. But thanks for another glitch, the dismembered hand is still able to move and punches Rakuro, knocking him out and winning the game for Katso. Even though he lost, Rakuro is still glad to get the change of pace and fight another person rather than only NPCs. Hearing Rakuro say that he has been fighting NPCs, he realizes that he was being serious when he emailed him to say he was going to start playing Shangri-La. But he never thought he would see the day where Rakuro would play a game that was actually good. Rakuro tells him to listen first. There are these monsters in Shangri-La called the Seven Colossi that are ridiculously strong, and they are so rare that across the entire player base, they only know the names of four of them. And since the game launched a year ago, not a single person has actually managed to defeat one of these monsters in a fight and Rakuro got killed by one of them recently. So he has decided that he won't stop playing the game until he has defeated Lick again. Hearing Rakuro talk about Shangri-La so enthusiastically, Katsu decides that he will start playing as well. He also messages someone else they know to tell her that Rakuro is playing Shangri-La. This person, Arthur Pencilgon, receives the message while in the middle of combat with several players and she's also shocked that Rakuro would play a game that isn't trash. But as she finishes off the rest of the players around her, she talks about how she is going to have to find him in the game and I assume that means she wants to fight him because she is clearly not against killing other players. Meanwhile, Rakuro logs back into Shangri-La and returns to the second village. He returned here with Emil through a teleport gate, which she can use anytime she wants, but she asks him why he wanted to come back here so soon when there is a bunch of interesting stuff he can do in the Rabatuza Palace. He tells her he is definitely interested in taking a tour of the palace, but there was something he had to do here first. There have been a lot of new players in the game since summer break started, and due to this, the starter village is completely packed with them. So he wants to get to the third village before he takes on the Rabatuza unique scenario is once the players start pouring in here. The village is going to get crowded and resources are going to become scarce as people fight over them. She didn't understand a single word of what he just said, but she's happy to go along with whatever he wants to do, so if he wants to get to the third village, she will gladly help him get there. After saying that, she sends in a party request, surprising Rakuro because he wasn't aware that he could have NPCs in his party. Imul says it's only natural since he can't get back into Rabatuza without her, but he just thought she would follow him around until he wanted to go back. He accepts the request and has Emil climb in his shoulder so they can get going. But then two girls walk past him and notice Emil, thinking she is cute and ask him how he managed to get a Vorpal bunny as a pet. Since this is part of a unique scenario that only he knows about, he would like to keep it to himself until he has finished clearing it. So he takes off running without answering any of their questions. But before he can get out of sight, one of the girls takes a picture of him and Emil, so they can ask the forums about it later. They make it to the wastelands and Emil asks what he came all the way out here for. Rakuro tells her that he had something he wanted to check related to his curse. It says monsters of lower levels will flee from him, so he puts it to the test as a monster charges at him. Once the monster spots the curse marks on him, it turns around and starts running for its life, so Rakuro chases it down into a wall, and as it turns to the left, he blocks its path and kills it with the extra momentum from his chase. Emil compliments him on his ferocity, while hunting down a monster that was trying to flee from him, so he takes it as a compliment and tells her that now he has confirmed that low-level monsters won't attack him, they are going straight to the area boss and will just ignore the monsters along the way. While they head over to the area boss, Rakuro realizes that he forgot to get any information about the boss before heading out to kill it, so he asks Imul if she knows anything about it. She tells him that it's a monster called Mud Digger and comes out of the ground to attack you, so it is very important to find a way to keep it in place if planned to defeat it. Once they get there, Rakuro finds that the battleground is a swamp as far as the eye can see. Mud Digger emerges from the ground and Rakuro realizes that he is in the worst possible case scenario for his build. Because of not being able to wear armor, he put all his stats into his speed, but a swamp forces a player into a walking state, meaning you won't be able to use any of his speed here at all. 
He's got no idea what to do as the monster leaps up into the air and dives into the mud that is supposedly six inches deep. Don't think about it too much. It is fast approaching them, and the mud prevents him from jumping out of the way like he normally would, so he instead comes up with a plan to evade using one of his skills which upgraded. Thanks to the experience he gained from his fight with Lekagen, a lot of his usual skills reach a new level, and consequently, as the monster turns to attack him again, Rakuro reveals that he has unlocked the next level of perfect parry, Repel Counter, allowing him to not only block the incoming attack, but to also perform an attack of his own in the split second after blocking. He has successfully countered, but the immediate problem of his lack of mobility still hasn't been addressed yet, and there is the matter of the recast time of his skills, meaning he can't use them again for a few seconds, so he is a sitting duck for the mud monster's strikes. It swims towards him and launches another attack while Rakuro is still unable to move, but luckily for him, he's not alone as Emil puts on her glasses and pulls out a book to back him up with her magic spell and knock it back. Rakuro is greatly impressed by her magic and thankful for saving his life there. He realizes that he has been too focused on playing solo this game, and had forgotten that he has Emil here to help him. It kinda hurts his gamer pride that he is relying on an NPC that is stronger than him, but when in Rome, you let the magic bunny do her thing. The monster has been stunned, so Rakuro wants to use this chance to close the distance between them and attack it, but it is still painfully slow. By the time they have finally made it to the monster, it has had enough time to wake up, roll out of bed, and make a cup of coffee, so it once again tries to attack the two of them. But during that time, Rekura has managed to get close enough to put it within striking distance, so he uses one of his upgraded attacks to hit it and deal some extra knockback. He then uses his knives to scale the side of the monster and get on top of it before asking Emil to use some of her magic to make a big boom on his forehead. And while she charges up the spell, he is just going to keep balancing on its nose, since he has played way harder platformers than this, so he's not going to be falling off anytime soon. The monster then switches tactics and tries to attack him while he is in the air, but he is out of luck as the cooldown on Rekuro's repel counter has reset, and he once again uses it to block and return an attack of his own. And at the same time, Emil has finally finished charging her spell, so she unleashes the edge slash, striking the monster to the ground. Rakuro also falls down, taking some fall damage, but he is more focused on how amazing Emil's attack power was, and Emil is focused on her clothes that got all money now. He is happy with how well the attack worked on the monster. But wait, where did it go? He looks around but can't see any signs of it until the ground beneath his feet starts shaking and he is unable to move. All gamers know what this means and Makuro is already within the kill zone. So he picks Emil up and throws her out of range to at least save her. He has accepted his fate, but as the monster pops out from under him, he is surprised to find that he is still alive. He took a bit of damage, but he was expecting an insta-kill, but he was just thrown into the air. However, from this height, he can tell what's going to happen next. The monster is a catfish quadruped with mole-like capabilities. It is known to have a special move set, which is only activated once its HP is at a certain level. It dives deep into the swamp and vibrates it, locking players in place. It then randomly knocks one of the players into the air with its nose, but the damage comes from the fall afterwards. If a player challenges the boss alone, the random chance will be turned into a guaranteed hit, which will inevitably shave down their health after a few attack cycles. Rakuro is annoyed because an unavoidable attack doesn't even factor in player skill, but he still has to think of a way to save himself before he goes splat. He sees Emil making her way towards him and thinks about asking her to use her magic to strike him to cancel out the fall damage, but the strike alone would probably kill him anyway. He doesn't have any magic items on him, so plain and simple, he's fucked. And the fall damage deaths in these kinds of games always feel so real, so it's not going to be a pleasant feeling. However, before he can feel the experience of his neck folding in on itself, Emil manages to get up to him and activate a magic item she possessed to teleport them away. But, it just teleported them back into the air so fall damage is still a problem. However, as they are now above the mud digger, it is now its problem as with all the momentum that Rakuro picked up, falling on it now counts as an attack. So to the mud digger, congratulations, you played yourself. And thanks to his luck stat, Rakuro managed to survive the fall with 1 HP left, which seems unlikely, but he's not gonna complain about it. He has now leveled up to level 29 and Emil congratulates him on a job well done. The fight was pretty tough comparable to the time he fought Lickagon, but the key difference this time is that he actually survived the ordeal and cleared the boss. They continue walking to the third city and Rakuro takes a fist full of herbs, shoving them down his mask to eat and regain some of his health, which looks really weird to Emil. Emil is excited that once they get to the third city, Rakuro will finally go back to Rabatuza and start training there. 
but there is still the problem of how he is going to hide Emil from the people in the city, since he would rather not draw too much attention to himself there. If anyone figures out that he has a unique scenario, he might even get jumped because of it. So to help avoid that, Emil shows that she has a special bracelet that allows her to transform into a human. She is quite pleased with herself since she should now be able to get into the city without drawing any attention to Rakuro. But Rakuro is lost in thought because he had thought this was meant to be a god tier number one game for Japan. But once the bunny girl line is crossed, you start to drift into harem territory and there's no coming back from that. Emil suddenly transforms back because apparently the transformation is quite taxing and leaves her feeling very exhausted, so four or five minutes is all she can handle for now. She will transform again when they get near the town, but will have to undo it once they are in private. However, even with Emil's transformation, there is still only so much you can do to be conspicuous when you are a character with a bird head and no clothes. They finally make it to the third village, and while Emil is in awe of its beauty, Rakuro just goes, Oh cool city I guess. He has played a lot of games and seen a lot of cities, so something like this isn't all that special to him. They make their way down the mountain into the city gates, so Emil transforms once more. Once they arrive, as expected, the guards find it strange that Rakuro has no clothes on and wonder if he was mugged on his way here, but Emil then jumps in with a long-blown out-of-proportion story of Rakuro and his adventures, so the guard give up and just let them pass. But at the same time, Rakuro is getting a bunch of death glares making him think something is up, since that doesn't normally happen. He and Emil are about to leave when Rakuro is suddenly grabbed by the worst kind of assailant, a furry. A few hours earlier, after he ran away from those two girls that were questioning him, they took a picture and uploaded it to a forum to get information about the bunny. And with the information circulating, that is when Rakuro caught the attention of the furry. One of the veteran players called the two girls out for doxing Rakuro, because they didn't get his consent before uploading his information. But that's not where it ended because other players started to notice Lekavin's curse marks on him and are getting interested in it. Some even plan to spawn kill him until he explains everything about it while others are making an effort to protect him. So he's going to have to deal with a lot of people now. And right now, the first person to confront him is this girl asking him how he got that bunny. Rakuro realizes someone must have leaked his information but tries to play it off like he doesn't know anything. However, shortly after he gets attacked by Arthur Penciledon, whom he knew from other trash games they played together. But she hasn't come for a friendly chat, she is here for blood and he is going to have to be ready to face her. She's a friend in the art of trash games and an avid player, but to understand their relationship, we must first go to the trash game, Unite Rounds. We see two players looting the store of an NPC who was just innocently trying to make a living, but as they walk away with their haul, the looters fall victim to Rakuro, who is on his own looting spree. The game was originally made to provide immersion into the story of a kingdom on the brink of collapse with the players taking on the role of knights fighting to defend the people, but the game devs had a boner for the suffering of their players, so they made the drop rates unreasonably low. I mean seriously, even rocks only have a drop rate of 40%. With these kinds of drop rates, the first quest, which was just a simple herb gathering quest, took 12 hours to collect by hand in the swamp, so naturally players had to find an easier way to get what they needed, and the secret ingredient was crime. If you didn't want to waste time finding items for yourself, just rob a store or steal them from a player who already has it. And with such a dangerous world where every other player is an enemy, there was a figure who made their way to the top of sheer violence and tons of NPC blood. That was Pencil Knight, and under her, the Pencil Kingdom was formed. But when your ruler is a ruthless plunderer, the rest of the players wouldn't last long. Then, later on, Rakuro and Katso happened to come to the castle while playing. Rakuro takes a moment to look through the items that the dead players had on them and Katso questions the objective of the game. He thought it was to protect the people in this kingdom from monsters, but all players are worse than those monsters. None of the countless war crimes committed really mattered though because they came here for one reason and one reason only. They are here to assassinate the Pencil Knight. She established herself as the most powerful player on the server and would abuse anyone who did not join her side, and now she sits in her throne room with the new name of Dystopian Empress. She is surprised to see that people actually made it to her throne room alive and says she will remember Rakuro and Katsuro's names as she gets up to fight them. She has got a long history with Rakuro, but back in Unite Rounds, they always fought to a draw where they would both end up dying. But now, she is much higher level than him, so he is at an outstanding disadvantage. She charges at him and slashes with her sword, but Rakuro ducks underneath and their faces get really close as she tells him he should be flattered that she came all the way here just to kill him. She flies past him and uses her sword to catch herself while throwing three knives at Rakuro. He dodges them easily, and she complains that those knives were useless even though they are so expensive. She asks Rakuro what level he is because even he should be around level 30, he is dodging really well. 
Meanwhile, the furry has just recognized Pensilagon as the second in command of the player killing clan on the server, nicknamed Giant Killer. Meanwhile, Emold is starting to get tired and her transformation is wearing off. Rakuro asks why she is called the Giant Killer, and she explains that when she started playing initially, she would focus on ambushing and killing players that were much stronger than her. But then the devs patched that out, so it's been a lot harder to do lately. Rakuro finds it funny that she was going after the giants of the game when she got herself killed as the giant of Unite Rounds, but she doesn't find it very funny and attacks him again. He dodges and counters her, leading to a heated exchange of blows. Pensilivan tells him that her clan leader asked her to come here to deliver a message to Rakuro. He has to publish the information on the unique scenario, or he will be hunted down until he does. However, Rakuro isn't feeling very scared by the threat. He is able to dodge and block all of Pensilagon's strikes, but there is still a huge gap in their equipment level, so beating her isn't very likely. He notices that Pensilagon is trying to keep him away from the city gate, probably because it would make it harder to fight him if she were in there, but he still has to think of a way to get past her. While he is still fighting Pensilagon, Emil is fighting to keep her transformation together, but as the furry taps her on the shoulder to ask her a question, she loses focus and turns back into a bunny. And honestly, I fear for what may happen while she is in the hands of a furry. However, he thinks of a way to get out of this mess and uses Repel Counter to push Pensilagon back a bit. He then calls to Emil to get on his shoulders and starts running to the city. The furry cries about at least wanting to get a photo with Emil, to which Rakuro says he will consider it if he can survive this. Pensilagon gets back on her feet and starts chasing Rakuro, but before she can catch up, she gets blocked by the furry. She does really care about Rakuro, but she is not gonna let that bunny die. Rakuro is happy to escape and is about to make it to the city gate so Emul can teleport him to Rabatuza, but it seems that Pensilagon did not come here alone. The players in front of Rakuro are all players from the player-killing clan that were sent to kill him. They dislike killing people that have low levels compared to them since the penalties for doing so are really bad, but their boss sent them here precisely because he didn't want to have to deal with the penalty. Pensilagon wanted to handle Rakuro, but now she gets the chance to fight a member of the Shangri-La Pita clan, is a good chance as well. So she's okay with how things turn out. The four player killers attack Rakuro at once, and he's having a hard time dodging all their attacks, but he is not one to buckle in the face of a challenge. Even when that challenge is better gear, higher level, and greater stats. And Amelia fires off a magic attack at Pensilagon, which should be enough to defeat her. But as she takes a better look, she realizes that Pensilagon is actually absorbing all the magic and not taking any damage at all. And after the spell has been fully discharged, she fires it straight back at Animalia knocking her back and draining almost all of her HP. Animalia had a specialty in debuffs for the purpose of weakening the enemy, but with all those curses being reflected back at her, she is left in an incredibly weak state. Pensilagon was aware of how scary curses can be as they bypass all armor and normal defenses, so she always carries around this item which reflects all curses cast back at the caster. So now, Animalia is helpless and will slowly die to her own magic. Across the battlefield, Rakuro is still engaged in deadly combat with the player killers and evading their strikes with great precision. They all come at him at once, so Rakuro decides to pick one of them out as a target while he is still being underestimated by them. But the real problem here is that he won't be able to damage the high-level players with their armor. However, he is in luck because his stalker, I mean Rei, has come to save him. She kills one of the player killers with a single slash and the others are scared as hell because they recognize her as the attack master. Rakuro doesn't know who she is, so he just thinks this is more trouble coming his way, but Rei looks back and confirms that it is indeed Rakuro. Back in the real world, Rei was feeling down about not being able to find Rakuro in the game at all, and asking him in person still isn't an option. All the games Rakuro plays were all too hard for her to get into and she's been keeping a catalog of every single game he has played, so she has tried them all. But with Shangri-La, she's actually good at this one and with Rakuro playing it, she can't miss this chance to actually talk to him. She logs into the game and immediately receives a message from her sister about a person matching Rekuro's description, so she gets out of the second city and just starts sprinting. This is the first chance she has gotten to actually meet Rakuro here, so she isn't going to let him die and charges in. And as a plus, if she can save him from the player killers, she will actually have a reason to talk to him in the game. And maybe one day in real life too. Pinsilagon is busy thinking about how Rakuro's skill he built up from all those years of playing trash games has made him something much more important than high stats or equipment, he's just good. And with Katso also playing, she thinks the project she was thinking of starting would be more achievable. She looks over to the battle and notices that Rei is also here and can't believe she managed to find so many strong players in one go like this. She is about to run over there, but Animalia is not dead yet. 
That item that reflects spells is extremely powerful. So the devs had to balance it by making it so it doesn't reflect any more than five spells. So now that the item can no longer reflect her magic, how will she handle her trump card? We see a bit of how Rei began to fall for Rakuro. She was walking to school alone and was quietly watching Rakuro as he talked with a friend of his about how terrible the latest trash game he played was, but how much fun he had playing it, and she thought he looked like he was having fun. Later in school, she sees Rakuro talking to another one of his friends and remarks again that he always seems to be having so much fun, but then realizes that she is crossing into stalker territory and goes about her business. Later in judo practice, after hip throwing a dew to the ground, she realized that she may have actually become interested in Rakuro. And that was the day she passed the point of no return and officially became a stalker. She would follow him to the game store and watch him from the corner of the room, fantasizing about actually going up and talking to him. But that was when Mana approached her and reminded her about the store's no stalking policy. She tried talking to him once while he was passing through the halls, but he was busy with his friend and talking to him when he was alone would be way too embarrassing. So she wanted to try something easier first like in a game. So here we are. With all that stalking having paid off, she has finally found Rakuro. And saving him here is sure to be a good conversation starter, so she's going to give it all she's got. Rakuro doesn't know that she is Rei, but he recognizes that the character is extremely powerful and thinks they must be here to get information about the unique scenario as well. He needs some way to get past them all without dying and meanwhile, Animalia is getting ready for her final stand against Pensilagon. After taking the brunt of all her own spells, her health is in the red and dropping fast, however, Pensilivan has used all her spells' reflection items, and that means the next one is going to hit. She activates her trump card spell and her staff begins doing this. The spell she is about to cast requires high-level spell mastery and the user's health to be in the single digits, but once activated, it is an instant death that takes both the user and the target down. And as Pensilivan realizes it is too late to get out of range, Animalia has one final thing to say before they both die. Get wrecked, bitch. The purple light envelopes the both of them as they perish, and that light provides Rakura with just the distraction he needed to escape the attackers, and he is not going to miss this opportunity. He tells Emil to get the gate to Rabatuza ready as he runs up Ray's sword and steps on her head with his bare feet, apologizing for using her like this before jumping over the player killers and behind them. Then he starts making another mad dash for the city gates, and the player killers try to stop him because if he goes into the city, they follow him or they'll be swarmed by bounty hunters. However, Ray keeps them busy long enough for Rakuro to escape, and he makes a note to remember that character if they ever meet again. The player killers are angry with Ray for interfering in their mission, but she is too busy creaming herself because Rakuro just touched her with his bare feet and actually spoke to her. One of the player killers sees that she is acting weirdly and tries to get a sneak attack in, but Ray snaps back to reality as she realizes that she could have gotten the chance to talk to Rakuro more if these people weren't attacking him. So from no win, it's a personal beef and she's gonna make sure none of them leave here alive. Meanwhile, Rakuro has finally made it back to Rabatuza and is relieved that they are now safe. Rakuro gets a message from Pensilagon after she died to clarify that he had nothing to do with her death, so he technically didn't beat her. But there's something else she wants to discuss, so she wants to meet up with him and Katso and unite rounds so they can talk. He finds the invitation to be very fishy, and so does Katso, but it could at least be a bit interesting, so they might as well hear out what she wants to say. But before he does that, he wants to finally begin the unique scenario training in earnest. He asks her how they are going to do the training, and she tells him she'll show the way to the room they use for practical combat training. The Vorpal Coliseum Vashant said he wanted Rakuro to defeat 10 monsters here as the first part of his training, with the rules being that he can only use Vorpal weapons like those knives he has. He agrees and asks for the battle to begin. He doesn't really expect to be able to get through all 10 battles on the first try, but after he learns the skills and movement patterns, he might be able to pull it off. However, as the gate is raised instead of just one monster, he is faced with a pack of wolves as his first opponent, all of whom are at least level 65 while he's still below level 30. So in short, he gets dogpiled and dies a gruesome death. Elsewhere, after she had finished killing all the player killers, Rei logs out of game and continues to cream herself over Rekuro's first words to her. She thinks about what she should do the next time she manages to meet him and decides that she will send him a friend request if she gets the chance and hopes Rekuro will accept it. And maybe from there, they can extend their relationship to real life too. That's a lot of exciting things she is thinking about, but now she needs to change her underwear and gets out of bed. Meanwhile, Rakuro is on his seventh try at the first trial of Rabatuza, and Emil cheers him on, saying seventh times the charm as the wolves pour out of the gates once more. At least when he dies in this arena, there isn't a death penalty like what happens when he dies outside, so he can keep fighting as much as he wants. 
But at the same time, the wolves aren't exactly easy to fight. It's not their numbers, or the fact that every single one of them is twice as level that makes them difficult to beat, but rather, it's the fact that they work together extremely efficiently and don't give him any time to fight back. This kind of coordinated jumping only occurs when there's someone giving out commands in the team, and after fighting these wolves 12 times, he can tell exactly who is giving out those commands. It's the one wolf that only ever barks when it is in a safe spot and never actually joins in on the fight. He targets the leader wolf and activates Spiral Edge to stab the wolf and lower its HP a little. The wolf leader begins to run away from Rakuro and without it giving the others orders, their attacks became far less coordinated and easily avoidable. So Rakuro is able to focus on killing the commander before it can give out any more orders. He throws one of his knives, stabbing the wolf in the back and slashing it several times until its health drops to zero and it dies. And now that their leader is dead, the rest of the wolves are nothing but a pack of isolated monsters which he can easily take care of by himself. And with that, the first round has been cleared. Imul congratulates him on the victory over the pack of wolves. But Rakuro just wants the next monster to be a single one and not a team. Imul assures him that the next monster is alone, but as she opens the gate, the monster might technically be alone, but if you are able to greet one of your heads good morning, is basically the same as fighting a team. So the hard grind to complete the challenges continued and Rakuro managed to defeat the tentacle bear by cutting off all its tentacles as they attacked him. After that, he had to face a goblin that had been hitting the gym, but no matter how big the goblin's guns were, they were no match for Rakuro. Then there was the bird and Rakuro will never forgive it for betraying its own kind and pooping poison on him. So this one took over 100 attempts to finally kill. He has finally completed 9 out of the 10 trials, but even after all that fighting, his level only went up by 2 points because of that Vorpal Collar, and he is so angry about it that he starts with Jojo posing. He's starting to lose his mind a little what he says he is still primed and ready for the final battle of the trial. And just then, Vash shows up to congratulate Rakuro on beating the ninth monster of the trial. He hadn't expected him to be done with 9 by now, but it's perfect timing because he just got something for him. Rakuro thinks this is probably an event triggered by completing the ninth battle. So now for the tenth monster, Vash has brought someone he just captured. He tosses the monster into the ring and removes the binding spell he had placed on it to allow it to fight. It was a person who tried to extend their life by combining themselves with a tree, giving them a constant case of literal morning wood. Rakuro has no idea what that thing and doesn't think it would be human either, but is clearly a sorcerer type. Vash doesn't expect Rakuro to be able to beat that thing anytime soon, so he sets the clear condition for this trial to simply be surviving for 5 minutes against it. Rakuro doesn't think that is going to be much of a challenge for him. But the tree sends a root attack at him that makes him eat those words. He is struggling, and just barely able to keep up with its onslaught attacks, realizing that 5 minutes may be a pretty long time to stay alive. With over 30 million players in Shangri-La Frontier, Rakuro is still the first person to ever fight this monster that is over level 120, but it will be a long time before he realizes that. After dodging for a while, he realizes he isn't getting anywhere with this thing, and needs to do something different, so he switches tactics and starts charging towards the tree wizard, slashing at it with his knives. But this thing must have been munching on iron for breakfast, because those knives did no damage at all. So realizing his knives are basically useless for the duration of this fight, Rakuro sticks to what he can do dodging while a mix of chains and roots fly at him once more. Emil sounds the horn to tell Rakuro that he has successfully evaded the monster for one whole minute. Only four more to go and Vash says he is eager to see what Rakuro can do, while having his bunny hose all over him. Rakuro thinks of the situation and gives a detailed analysis of just how screwed he is. This thing is a monster with root attacks that have no lead up, so you have to dodge on instinct. Then there are those chains that look like they'll give you tetanus if they so much as touch you, and to top it off, they chase you like it's their god given right to tie you up. Dodging all this is a bit much, but that's not even the end of it, the dude still fires magic attacks every now and then to throw Rakuro off his game, and the more time passes, the more magic he uses against him. This battle is getting increasingly harder as two goes on, and now he's barely got a quarter of a second to gain his footing before the next attack is already here. He's dodging these attacks like the people at Anime Con dodge deodorant, but it's not going to get any easier from here. And the whole time, the tree is smiling and enjoying every moment of torment he's inflicting on Rakuro. He activates a new kind of spell, involving some sort of poison gas, only adding to Rakuro's pain as he darts around. And it's only been two minutes so far. He's starting to think he might actually have a better shot at beating Likagon than even surviving against this thing. He is starting to lose hope and thinks it might be alright for him to die for now so he can go home and think of a new strategy. 
After all, it's not like he'll die in real life if he dies here. But that's quitter talk, and Rakuro didn't quit when he had to deal with those trash games, so why would he quit here? He's played so many games where winning is literally impossible due to bugs that he has subconsciously begun to expect to die a couple of times before completing a task. But this isn't a trash game, and it's not a forced loss battle either. This is completely doable, so he is not going to relinquish his life until he actually does it. Rakuro puts a hold on all the dodging and climbs onto the tree root, intriguing Vash. He then starts running up it and gets within melee range, but Vash doesn't see the point if he has already figured out that his attacks don't do any damage to it at all. However, Rakuro doesn't want to damage it, he's going for something more practical. He's robbing the tree. Without its staff, it shouldn't be able to cast any more spells, which should cut down on the amount of attacks Rakuro has to deal with. The tree is not happy about this because he took out a loan to pay for that fancy staff, so he uses the full force of his roots and chains to launch another attack on Rakuro, as he still has two minutes left before he has cleared the challenge. After losing the staff, the monster is going berserk, and Rakuro is having trouble keeping up with the constant and faster barrage of chains and roots. The tree keeps trying to get his life-saving staff back, but Rakuro only has one minute of evading left before he wins the round. As he continues to run, the tree puts up a wall of roots in his path, slowing him down long enough for the chains to wrap around his foot and make it completely impossible to dodge. With seconds left on the clock, the tree charges at the completely immobile Rakuro, but he gets an idea and tosses the staff into the air, forcing the tree to chase after it and buying him just enough time to clear the whole five minutes. However, the boss music hasn't stopped playing and the tree is still firing spells at him. The whole survive for five minutes thing was Vash's idea, and the tree never really agreed to do that, he just wanted to kill Rakuro. But before he gets killed, Vash steps in to save him, one-shotting the monster that Rakuro could do no damage against. Vash congratulates him on the successful completion of the quest and presents him with his reward. He is now an honorary Rabbituzan, and while it's not like he doesn't appreciate the citizenship, he was hoping for something like a rare item. But nope, that's all he gets, see you next week. There was at least an additional unique scenario that doesn't want to deal with that right now, so he logs out for the day and finally goes to sleep. Later on, he's back in the game and taking a look at that unique scenario he got after finishing the last one, but he's got no idea what it actually is. It has something to do with divinity and some ruins, but the wiki related to that is a full thousand-page thesis, and he didn't come here to have to study. He immediately accepted it since it was a unique scenario, but he didn't know how he was supposed to get it to even begin in the first place, so he decided to put a hold on the unique scenario's stuff for now and do something else. So they are going to head out of Rabatuza. However, if he recalls that people are on the lookout for him, he will definitely get jumped on sight again if they recognize him in the city. And even though he could change his mask to keep his identity hidden, the Lekagun's mark would still draw too much attention and cause him to be found out. He still can't put on anything gear on his torso either, so covering up the mark with armor isn't going to be possible either. Emil has a suggestion if he is trying to cover himself up and takes him to another bunny in Rabatuza Pete's. He's her brother and also runs a shop with items from all over the world and sells them here, but he clarifies that he doesn't sell things exclusively in Rabatuza. He also goes to the human world as well, though not as often since he has to transform into a human to do so. But if Birdman ever happens to see him out in the city, he's free to come say hello to him. Rakuro appreciates the offer, but feels the need to mention that he is still a regular human, he just happens to wear a bird mask as a matter of style. Back on topic, Rakuro is looking for something to cover up his body which won't be affected by Lekagan's curse, and will keep his identity secret. And Pete's seems to have just the thing to solve that problem for him. It's a cloak. Does it look good? No, but it's a cloak. He buys a map of the city and heads out with Imul, but he can only keep it together for so long because this thing is definitely a mean costume. She tries to calm him down so he doesn't draw too much attention to themselves, and they continue down the path. At least he was able to buy the map and some recovery potions to keep Imul's transformation going, so they should get going to the next area before their items run out. On the map, there seem to be three different areas they can head to from here. The lush forest, the volcano lake, and the ancient iron ruins of divinity. Rakuro is lost in thought thinking of which area to visit first, and he finally come to the conclusion to go to the lush forest. His reasoning is that though the iron ruins of divinity sound really rewarding, with all the technology they have there, the enemies have things like guns, it would be a pain to deal with that. While he was talking, Emil looks behind them and spots Ray's character stalking him just like she does in real life. And as he turns around to see the knight just watching him from behind a corner, he's thrown off by her stare him down cause she's looking really menacing right now. In a shipwreck somewhere on the map, the leader of the Ashura Kai player Killers, Orkalot reprimands his team for bringing shame to the guild's name by failing to kill Rakuro, 
They apologized and explained that they had no way of knowing that the attack master would join in on the fight, so they stood no chance. He counters that this is a unique scenario that they are talking about here, so it is only natural to expect that other top players would join in on the hunt. But with that being the case, Pinsaligon questions why he hadn't come out to join them in the fight. He says he had stuff to do, so it was definitely not because he was scared or anything. Changing the topic, he speculates that the rabbit he was carrying around in the picture must have something to do with the unique scenario. He thinks Rakuro is a newbie, so he mustn't be familiar with the mechanics of the game. So he wants them to find Rakuro and make him tell them how he did it, even if they have to threaten to dox him. That's all well and good, but Pinsiligan thinks they should focus a little more on finishing off the unique monster they found first. Orkalot grows exasperated and tells her that unique monster battles aren't made to be beatable in the first place, so there is no point in trying to beat one. For now, they are the only ones that know how to make him show up, so he just wants to make good use of the experience that they get from the encounter to help boost the clan's firepower. Seeing that they aren't going to be of much help with her plans, Pensiligan gets up to leave. The Ashura Kai used to challenge any and all people that came their way head-on, which was why she joined. But after the new update that hit player killers with heavy penalties, they became more reserved about what fights they took on, valuing stability more. She would never have thought she would end up putting her body on the line for a simple NPC, but here she is, and if she's going to take the gamble of winning or losing, she's gonna bet everything she's got on it. No matter what, she will take down the unique monster. Back to Rakuro, who has just noticed Rei watching him from the corner, he thinks she must be here for revenge for him stepping on her earlier, so he doesn't want to stick around to find out what she's gonna do, and makes a run for it. The Ashura clan members that were tasked with finding Rakuro are still out on the prowl for him, but since they can't find his bird character, they assume he must have gone to a different area. That is until they see him running down the streets to get away from something. They think it is just a weirdo running around in a ghost costume at first, but after seeing Rakuro's name above the weirdo's head, they realize it's their target and begin to chase after him. Rakuro and Emil run across the roofs while being chased by the clan, so he tells Emil that they will be going to the next location. The clan sees the direction he is running in and thinks he is heading to the Iron Ruins of Divinity, so they call on the rest of the clan to lay an ambush for him. However, this was all part of Rakuro's plan since he is taking a roundabout route to the lush forest to make his pursuers think he is heading to the Iron Ruins. That way, he can double back around and return to the forest once they've lost sight of him. And then they'll set up an ambush for him at the wrong location. It was a flawless plan, but it didn't account for a professional stalker like Ray. He thinks he is done for, but as she raises her hand, he is greeted by a friend request instead of a fist. Ray then says her first words to him, asking if they can be friends. Rakuro is confused by the sudden friend request, but it doesn't seem to be a ploy to get him to lower his guard, because if it was, he would have been dead by now. He thinks she might be trying to get him to tell her about the unique scenario, but all that fidgeting she is doing doesn't match up with a goal like that. Whatever she is planning, he has to respect that she was able to see through his rouse and find him here, so he chooses to accept the friend request to see what she has planned. Rei is elated to see that her friend request was accepted. When she lost sight of Rakuro, she didn't know what to do, so she just chose between the three random locations and went to check one of them, and luckily, she turned out to be correct in her choice. She has gotten to meet him in the game and even managed to become friends with him, but the hard part comes next. Actually speaking with him, she asks in a really shy tone if he would like her to help him with the game since he is a new player and Rakuro takes this to be some genius plot to get him to owe her and reveal the secret of the unique scenario on his own, but he isn't going to fall for something like that so easily. So he politely declines, saying he doesn't like the idea of getting carried through a game by high-level players. She is disappointed and says she understands his point of view, but she would still like to team up with him at some point in the future, so they say their goodbyes and Rakuro heads off to do his thing. As he leaves, he questions whether he may have misread her intentions because she relented pretty easily for someone who was presumably trying to extort information from him. But there's nothing he can do about it now, so he decides to leave it as a problem for another day. Rei is disappointed that she didn't get to play with Rakuro. And there was also the girl with him, but it seemed like it was an NPC since it didn't have a player name attached. However, today counts as an overall win for Rei since she has officially had her first conversation with Rakuro. The Ashura Kai clan have realized by now that Rakuro gave them the slip and are coming to check the forest for him, but they see Rei standing in the middle of the path and decide they can check this place later. And as they run away, Rei is still giddy with excitement over today's victory and does a little dance. As Rakuro and Emil enter the forest, they can finally take off their disguises. He has been in many caves that had him met with gunfire or meteor showers, but with this one, they find themselves surrounded by a fantastical forest of glowing fauna and a wide array of insects buzzing around. And even here, 
A circle of life continues as the insects live and can be killed at any moment by the predators that lurk there. Rakuro is excited to see such a lively level and can't wait to get started. He spots one insect with its belly full of sap, and it is just begging to get killed for that round sack drop, so Rakuro equips his marsh daggers and gets ready to fight it. He runs up a tree and leaps into the air to slash it, but the insect is pretty nimble and evades his strikes. But in the end, it is still just an insect, and after he strikes at it one more time, it is too slow to dodge this time and gets cut up, leaving only its sack behind. Rakuro hangs from a tree and grabs the sack before it can hit the ground. He had figured that the sack would be pretty fragile, so he aimed for the butterfly's body, leaving the juicy sack intact. He has it as an item now, but he isn't sure what he is supposed to be using it as in the first place. The menu says that the nectar sack can be enjoyed by throwing it, but he's not sure what good that would do him. But regardless, he is still hyped to go around collecting many more drops in the area and eventually defeating the area boss. They continue their playthrough of the location and Rakuro finds something interesting. Emil looks but she can't see what he's talking about, so Rakuro tells her to just watch as he pulls out a throwing knife. She asks him why he has a knife here, and it stems from the trauma he got from getting killed by that poop bird. As a result, he sought after a means to handle monsters that are out of range and bought this knife as a countermeasure. He throws it, striking a mimicry mantis in the flower. The mantis had been running and hiding with its mimicry ability, so he needed to attack it from a distance to get a good hit in and finally come in close to defeat it. This way, he can take those things down without them having the chance to sneak up on him with their mimicry. Imul is fangirling over his masterful tactics and says he has managed to gather a lot of items here. And while he is happy with the pace they are going at, there is still one that he hasn't gotten the chance to acquire yet, and that's the giant beal that happens to currently be fighting some bees. It is huge, at about 5 meters big, and it seems that it managed to piss off the Empire Bees by feeding in their territory. So the Empire Bee Queen is giving out orders for the bees to attack it. This is some National Geographic shit, and Rakuro takes on the role of the narrator for this part. The quad beetle is mowing down the bees as their stingers can't pierce its armor and is making its way up to their nest. It's not looking good for the bees, but in a turn of events, they manage to form a crack along the beetle's armor and exposing it to extra damage. The bees have already begun their secondary assault on the now weakened beetle, and in a desperate struggle, the quad beetle flails around before releasing its wings and flying straight towards the queen bee, striking her with its horn. And folks, it looks like that was the end of the queen bee. With their queen dead, the rest of the bees began to scatter and the quad beetle went back to eating like a champion. But then it noticed Rakuro and Emil, and it looks like the champion is back in the ring to defend his belt. Rakuro doesn't know why it is so riled up at them, all he wanted was to take the drop from the queen bee after it had killed her, but the beetle must have thought Rakuro was coming after it instead. Rakuro thinks quickly, and remembering that this thing loves sap, he pulls out the juicy sack he fit from the butterfly and tosses it onto a nearby mantis, distracting the beetle into killing it. And with its back turned from the top rope, Rakuro leaps up and takes advantage of all the cracks on its shell, stabbing it like a man possessed before it finally dies. Luck was on Rakuro's side because he managed to get every single drop that can be gotten from a quad beetle, and with his inventory now full of stuff, he is satisfied with today's trip. Emil thinks it's a bit unfair that they killed the beetle only because it was already weak from fighting an entire army, but as with all wars, the person who is correct is always the one left alive. To end off today's events, they head to the final boss area and find more and more webs, and they approach the cave of the clown spider. This was the end of episode 9. Thanks for watching, subscribe to not miss the next part.